everybody. I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Green Goals, San Panga Panga Parque, Milano San Felice by Elisa Di Nofa and Francesco Paleari, published by Humboldt Books. Milano San Felice is a residential district on the eastern outskirts of Milan, founded in the late 1960s based on the idea of engineer Giorgio Pedroni and designed by architects Luigi Caccia Dominioni and Vico Magistretti. More than half a century after its conception, the book examines the relationship between the early settlers and urban planning, architecture and interior design of Milano San Felice, calling on both those who took part in the development phase and on its initial resident community, one which, with great care and pride, houses an incredible universe of private archives and personal and collective memories. Since I came to San Felice, this is the only flat I have ever lived in. My husband arrived in 1970, and in 1971 I came along too. It was just me and him. We chose a rented flat in Tower One because we didn't know whether we would have children or how many. Tower One was the first to be finished. All the flats in the towers were owned and rented by the insurance companies, all except those in Tower 2, which were for sale. I came here from Turin, and I remember very well the comment my dad made, even though he barely knew the surroundings of Milan. What are you going to do in that fog hole full of mosquitoes, far from everything and everyone? You lots are crazy. Our phone number ended with 008, while those from 001 to 004 were given to the administration. We really were among the very first ones. We arrived on September the 14th, 1970, and we slept at the Hotel Riviera. The next day, the lorry was due to come for the move into the new house. We were the 36th family to enter San Felice. A friend of ours said to us, why not go and stay in a place where the buzz of mosquitoes drones out the roar of the plains? This is how San Felice was seen. All this was because nobody else had understood that in the UK, new towns were already their norm. It was us who were out of touch with what was going on abroad. But when we came here, we took a risk. In the early years, the fog was like pea soup. You couldn't see anything, not even the road in front of you. We used to get lost in San Felice. Here, in the early years, there was no nursery and the children had to go to San Bovio by bus. We would send them off with a sense of impending gloom, because in the morning these children would be swallowed up by the fog, and you could only hope they would make it back in the evening. The night I had to go to the hospital to give birth, my husband drove straight off the road and into an irrigation ditch. There's still an irrigation ditch, the one near the club. It's called the Roggia Renata, in my honor. That evening, my husband and I had gone to eat at the Trattoria dei Cacciatori. You couldn't see a damn thing, and we ended up in a ditch. I walked from there to the Porner's Lodge, while my husband stood guard at the car. When I arrived, me and my big belly, a guard said to me, what can we do for you? If you would be so kind as to accompany me home, the workers, there was still the construction site underway, come along, ma'am, we will take you. They took me to Tower One, and when I said my waters had broken, they opened the door, planked me down and said, ma'am, if you need anything. And what happened then? Well, in the end, my husband found two guys who managed to salvage the car and bring him here to the house. We went to the Casa di Cura San Camillo in the Cinquecento. I gave birth the next day. 
especially in the beginning, perhaps because there were few of us, perhaps because we all felt a bit lost, perhaps because there was nothing here, there was a great spirit of solidarity. There was a sense of mutual aid and it emerged spontaneously. There was a lady who had connections with the wholesale vegetable market. The day she went to the market, on the landing of Tower One, we would split up the baskets of veg and everyone paid their share, because in the early days there were no shops here to speak of. Petrali would come out here from Milan when everything was still in complete disarray. At that time there was a shortage of coins, so he invented a new currency, which we called Petrol Dollars. Instead of giving you change, he would give you his plastic tokens. We opened the first shops in 1971. I got here in 1970, and my cousin had seen an advertisement for San Felice. I remember the day we decided to come and live in San Felice very well. It was a Sunday morning, a beautiful day, spring 1970. We were in Taranto, in a house by the sea. My wife went out to buy the Corriere della Sera newspaper. When she came back, we saw this magnificent double-spread advertisement about San Felice. My dad found a flyer on his car parked in the street back home in Milan. We went to see it and was immediately sold on the idea. Yes, I want to leave Milan, no more Milan. My cousin and I came here to see. It was all a construction site. Then I opened a shop in the shopping center, which I kept for 22 years, until 1993. It's still there, 50 years down the line, Alcazaro. I still remember the cones sold at Alcazaro, with whipped cream and cinnamon. I used to sell only cheese dairy products and the like, but now it's a grocery store, selling a bit of everything. Before I had the shop, however, I used to deliver door to door. In the morning we brought the milk, while the baker brought the bread. The delivery service was used by the women to organize meetings between the first residents. They would put little notes in the bread parcels delivered by Petrali. Tonight, meeting at X o'clock. At the entrance of the buildings there were lockers where we would leave milk and bread, while the mail was placed in the locked ones. We would arrive, ring the bell, someone would open the door, and we would just leave everything in the lockers. They were the most beautiful features of the buildings, and they're still there. That's a design by Luigi Caccia Dominioni, and it was part of the furnishings of the building. In fact, Caccia did the interiors of San Felice, while Vico Magistretti did the town planning. Town planning means this is the perimeter of the neighborhood, and this is where I put the houses. If you take Settima and Ottava Strada, for example, you don't realize what their volumes are. You don't have the sense of seeing six-story buildings or nine-story tower blocks. If you walk across the grounds, you don't get the impression that you are looking at huge buildings. This is town planning. Huge study behind it. They were very advanced then. My tower was designed by the architect Magistretti, while the lamps for the entrances and landings were done by Caccia Dominioni. A lot of famous architects passed through here, didn't they? In 1969 we weighed up both Milano 2 and Milano San Felice, when my husband, an architect, read the names of Magistretti and Caccia Dominioni, he had no doubts. Milano San Felice was a district designed by two famous architects, while Milano 2, on the other hand, was pretty anonymous. I have a floor by Caccia Dominioni in my kitchen. 
It used to drive me mad because it's not smooth. So from a functional point of view, it's nothing more than a gimmick. Let's face it. But I kept it because it went well with the kitchen. The kitchen I have is still the same, even though it has been subjected to slight adaptations. But the furniture is the same, even the oven is still the original one. Marietto was the technician who fixed almost all of our kitchens, replaced the appliances and sometimes even mended the furniture. He became one of the family. Marietto was the San Felice repairman. They would call him when they needed to change the kitchens, because some people wanted them more modern, and he would store all of the pieces away. You needed a piece of the original kitchen? He had a warehouse where he kept everything. Ferrara also used to salvage kitchen parts. He was mainly a plumber, but he also did building work. Mr. Ferrara, Matteo, was from the maintenance company that was here from the beginning. He did maintenance on the condominio centrale, and his son Saverio also worked with him. Ferrara is still working. You see him around the neighborhood sometimes. The kitchen is my wife's great love. We made just two changes. We have two diamond pattern doors because we had to replace them. We also replaced the countertop. It used to be stainless steel, the appliances and the sink. But everything else is original. This was the furniture they gave as standard in all the flats. The kitchen was designed by Caccia for San Felice and the color is for San Felice. It's an attractive color, it's not red, it's a strange shade. The color is that of Caccia Dominioni, so much so that all the houses Caccia built in Milan are this color. This is his color and he also brought it to San Felice. Each flat was provided with its own kitchen, bathroom and sanitary facilities, built-in wardrobes, laundry room and drying room. Those who bought were also given an S-shaped key ring, all made of silver. One side was green and on the other was written Milano San Felice. The furnishings were absolutely one of the factors that attracted people, both in terms of savings and of a convenient, alluring and very classy solution. There was a choice of flooring types. The ones we were offered were oak or panga panga. You could choose, but if they offered you panga panga, panga panga it was. The panga panga wood floor came in two versions, either with 8 by 20 cm strips or 80 cm ones. It was 22 mm thick and had to be laid on sand. Well, I still have panga panga wood floor in my flat, a wood with a unique robustness to it that is no longer sold today because it's a protected wood. San Felice is that floor, although it's not always understood. I have seen panga panga wood floor removed because dark floors are no longer in fashion. San Felice is like a small town within a town. Many people my age who grew up here no longer live here, but in small towns nearby, because it's much cheaper, but their roots are here. Those who move nearby still live their daily lives here. A friend of my father's, who has always lived in San Felice, sold his place when he ended up alone with his wife because it was too big. Not having found the square footage they were looking for, he moved to San Bovio. Every morning they get in the car and come here for coffee. They go home and come back here in the early afternoon to walk the dog. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.